Hi everyone, we're going to do some statistics today, which is kind of exciting, but I've brought along a friend of mine to help me out. This is Tom Crawford from Numberphile, you may recognise him. <laughs> Let's not go that far just yet. <laughs> yeah, I know you're trying to take my place as the most beloved presenter of Numberphile. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I am Tom, as James said, I have a channel, Tom Rocks Maths. Did a couple of number file videos. Let's not say from number file just yet. Um, and I teach maths at the University of Oxford, which is why you've invited me along. Yeah, so we were going to do a video about stats, and we've been planning to do this for ages. And then when we were going to do it, we found that uh, Professor David Speakerholder already did it with Brian Cox, and it's on the internet. <laughs> and we went, oh. So then we thought, oh, okay, we'll leave it some time. And then we were going to do it again. And then Matt Parker did it with Hannah Fry. And we went, oh. So we went, oh, we'll just do it anyway. So we're going to do it anyway. But we're going to do it with uh, a few more formulas, a few more numbers. And we'll put links to the other videos you know, in the description. Uh, but we are going to be talking about statistics and Bayesian statistics. Yes. So what's Bayesian statistics? It sounds Bayesian. fancy. Yes, so there are generally two approaches to, to statistics. So we have classical statistics, which is I want to assign a probability to an event that's going to happen in the future. Right. So I want to think, can I make a prediction? Cool. And then you have Bayesian statistics, which is where something has happened, there's a fact, but we don't know it. So it's like an unknown fact or a gap in our knowledge, and we assign a probability into the strength of our belief in that fact. So instead of having uncertainty in the future, we have uncertainty in our own knowledge. Exactly. OK, and to illustrate that, we're going to do a little experiment with this pool table. This is the idea for our experiment. So Tom is going to fire this cue ball uh, around the table. Uh, and it's going to land in some sort of random position. Yes. Um, and we're going to assume that every position is equally likely. And then we're going to try and predict where it's landed along its length. I'm not going to be looking. That's the key thing. So I'm going to be turning away. And then you're going to give me some extra information. Exactly. So I just, as James said, I'm going to fire the cue ball really random, every position equally likely, along the length of the table. OK. And you're not looking. But then I will give you information because I will fire 14 other balls around the table. Mm -hmm. Again, as random as possible, each mm -hmm. position equally likely. And I will tell you how many of these 14 balls lie to the left of the cue ball mm -hmm. and how many lie to the right. And then using that information, I am going to predict where the cue ball landed. Uh, shall we try it? Let's do it. Let's do it. I've got my cue. I've got my cue ball. Right. I think it's, it's time to go. OK, we're going to randomise that cue ball. OK, and now I need to measure the position. OK, I'm going to remove this one. There we go. You're seeing it on a <laughs> wild. Go for it. That sounded like a pocket ball. <laughs> um, you didn't hear anything. <laughs> Final random. OK. I, I'm not sure I could be more random. <laughs> OK. It's as good as it's going to get. OK, so to the left of the cue ball, we have, I'm going to say, eight. Eight on the left. I believe so. And how many cue balls to the right? Fortunately, there are six. I have made a prediction on my piece of paper. So we've now both got an answer. So you've got the true answer. The correct answer. <laughs> and I've made a prediction. So when we had eight balls to the left and six to the right, I feel like intuitively uh, a good answer would have been, I don't know, eight. 14ths along the table. Um, but I've actually gone for a different answer using Bayesian statistics. But Tom, you're going to explain why 8 fourteenths would be a good answer in classical statistics. So let's say the length of the table is 1. OK. So 0, 3 to 1. Yeah. Position of the cue ball is going to be P. 
Mm -hmm. Somewhere on this table. Somewhere on the table. So if it was a third, right, you've got P as a third. Yeah. About here. That means that the probability that a ball lands to the left is one third. Yep, makes sense. Probability is the right, two thirds. Yeah. So P and one minus P. Okay, so probability of being to the left is P, probability of being to the right, one minus P, but we had eight balls to the left? Eight balls to the left. So independent events for each ball means P multiplied by itself eight times. Mm -hmm. P to the eight. To the right, six balls, one minus P to the power six. Uh, <laughs> we both knew what was going, but the number of different yeah. ways of positioning 14 items, 14 choose 8. So all the different arrangements, which is a whole factorial thing in some the big number. The factorial thing. Yeah. So that is our probability. That's the probability of the data, probability of getting 8 to the left, 6 to the right. Exactly. Now, if we plot this as a graph, we can see there's a peak yeah. at the centre of the graph. Uh, and so that peak is when the data is most likely? Exactly. So the value that makes it most likely for us to have 8 to the left, mm -hmm. 6 to the right, the value for P is going to be 8 fourteenths. Fantastic. So it's a so, frequentist approach. So that means, so the idea is if you did this experiment a million times, then most often the most frequent result will be 8 to the left, 6 to the right. If P exactly. is what we think it is. If the true value is 8 sixteenths, 14ths. 8 fourteenths. Yes. Uh, so if you had like a, a million parallel universes, exactly. then most of them would have 8 to the left. And we're just assuming we're in the most frequent universe? Exactly. That is the frequentist approach to statistics. And that's where 8 fourteenths comes from. So the problem with that method is it's not actually calculating the probability of the position itself. It's calculating the probability of the data and it's kind of inferring what the position should be. It's kind of the position that maximizes the probability of the data. What I want to do is actually calculate the probability of the position itself. Now, before we did the experiment, I just thought every position must be equally likely. Now, once I've got information, that might change. I might decide that some positions have become more likely than they were before. Now, to do that calculation, I use something called conditional probability, which is looking at the probability of position after getting the data. Uh, but at the moment, I don't know how to calculate that. We're going to use something called Bayes' law. So some of you may have seen Bayes' law before. If you look it up in the textbooks, it looks like this. And the idea goes back to Thomas Bayes. Not, not, just, not just Mr. Bayes. <laughs> not just Thomas Bayes. Uh, yeah, there were other mathematicians who were involved with the, the theory as well, uh, Richard Price and Laplace. Mm -hmm. So now let me show you how I use Bayes' law to calculate the probability of position using the data that you gave me. So if you look at Bayes' law, it's now going to look like this. And actually, we've worked out a lot of this. The probability of the data is what Tom already worked out. We've got that. We just put that into the formula. The You're welcome. Yes, no, thank you very much. <laughs> the probability of position, well, before we had the information, we were just assuming every position was equally likely. Uh, now, to make it simple, let's just say oh, we'll divide the table up into 100 strips. So we've got little thin strips. So we're going to have like 101 possible positions, and then we're going to say those are equally likely. And then the only thing left to work out uh, is the probability of having eight balls to the left, mm -hmm. and then you just work it out for each position, and then you just add it all up, and it's kind of tedious, so I've already done it. And if you do the whole thing, that whole constant term turns out to be 446. Not to rain on your parade, James, but did we need the constant? No, so I've done more work than was necessary there because what you can do, and it's nice this, I really do like this, uh, we can just ignore the constant term altogether. Uh, so we can just say it's proportional to this, and then, well, the sum of the probabilities at the end have to add up to one, uh, so we just rescale everything at the end of the calculations. So now we've got a probability for each position, and we can plot that on a graph, we get this curve. Uh, so instead now of 
just maximizing the probability of the outcome and assuming we're in the most frequent universe. What I did, guilty. We can <laughs> use the, all those probabilities uh, to work out the average position. Uh, to work out the average position, you just take the probability of each position multiplied by the position. That's the formula for an average of position. Uh, so let's stick the numbers in that we've got. And I've got an average of 0 0.562512. There is no way on earth you did that in your head. No, I'm reading it off that piece of paper behind <laughs> the camera right now. I'm afraid I do have one of the slight issue with your calculation, James. With my otherwise perfect calculation, I have Let's... seen no problem whatsoever. It, it was otherwise perfect, but I'm just wondering why you picked 100 slices for the pool table. Yeah, OK, so it didn't have to be 100 slices. Uh, the idea is we wanted to take thin slices and then hopefully we get a reasonably accurate answer. My answer was still kind of a, an approximation uh, because in reality, uh, position is continuous. Uh, but if you imagine taking, instead of 100 slices, just more and more thinner slices, this would tend to uh, a continuous line. Uh, if you do that, you actually get a curve that looks like this. It's called the beta distribution. And we can use the beta distribution to work out the average position. Uh, there is, in fact, a formula for this. Uh, and the formula looks like this. So this is the formula for average position. And it means here, if we have L, L for left balls, uh, and R for right balls, then the average position will be L plus 1 divided by L plus R plus 2. This is the formula you get using the beta distribution for the average position. And I'm guessing this is the one you used. And this is the formula that I used for my prediction. Let's, let's check it. Let's so see, see if you're right. See if it's right. <laughs> OK, so I've got my prediction here. You've Are you got... nervous? I'm nervous. <laughs> I, I don't know. I have no... OK, so let's just emphasize I don't know what the true answer is. And you've got the true answer. I have the exact and I haven't seen it. Answer. I've got the Bayesian predicted answer. I'm really nervous. <laughs> uh, shall we see how they compare? OK, okay what shall we reveal first? Well, I should... Three, two, one. OK, three, two, one. All three, right, three, two, one. one. Go. Oh, now I'm not too sure about that. I've got 0.5625, reality 0.70. I don't know, I don't feel that's too close. So it's... statistics is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's something. However, however. Yes. Second bombshell, okay. ladies and gentlemen. I have my other calculation from the frequentist. Right. So this would have been the answer in a most frequent universe. In the most frequent universe. Instead of an average universe. We would have expected. A little bit higher. So I think. It's closer, isn't it? Frequentists. To hold three things. Frequentists are a little bit closer. I think frequentists. Than the average. Has beaten Bayesian. Oh no, it's all a disaster. Fine. Bayesian statistics is a lie. <laughs> Why did we make this video about Bayesian statistics? <laughs>no, we can't end like that, can we? James, this is your chance to defend your Bayesian calculation. Right, OK. So I am going to defend Bayesian statistics in a couple of ways. For a start, um, if we wanted to do more data, if we wanted to add more balls and get more results, then one nice thing about Bayesian statistics is I don't have to start again from scratch. So before, I assumed that every position was equally likely because I had no information. Now that I've got some information, I can actually use that probability as my starting point and then add extra information to it. That my results are going to get more accurate. <laughs> that's <laughs> one so. thing. <laughs> the other thing that's good about Bayesian statistics is we do get a full range of probabilities for all the positions. And we can use those probabilities for the positions in many kinds of calculations, not just working out the average position, other calculations as well, where we need the full range of probabilities for every position. There. Done it. <laughs> Defended. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. To, I'm, not, I'm not even sorry to say. I'm going to say, based on our experiment, I am, I am a frequentist. And that's a Bayesian argument.